Okay, so we have therapeutic drug monitoring that needs to be covered. Then we have to talk about toxicology, and we have to do tumor markers. I'm going to do toxicology last because we don't do a whole lot with toxicology um, in most of the hospitals. So first and foremost, we'll talk about therapeutic drug monitoring because it actually is kind of important. So on we go. Maybe if I can get this thing to go. There we go. Um, so what is therapeutic drug monitoring? Uh, we have to monitor the levels of the drugs in the person's plasma or serum uh, to determine that they're in an effective range. So there's a range of concentration for each individual where if it goes too low, it's not very effective, but if it goes too high, then it can actually become toxic and cause problems. So in between where we get too close to toxicity or too close to it's not working anymore is this range of level that is called the therapeutic range. Um, so we have, if you look at the picture, it says the therapeutic window. Okay. Um, and typically what happens is you give a patient some drug, okay, and then you're looking to see what happens with the patient, right? Is it helping? Is it hurting? Is it doing anything? So there are some people who respond well to therapies because it actually works and it does what it's supposed to do. It goes to the, to the point of action and, and can get the job done. And then there are patients that we call non-responders um, and they don't respond to the therapies that are given to them because something is inhibiting the binding or they just, it doesn't work the same for them. So if you know anybody who is on any type of um, psychotic medication, so for depression, anxiety, any, any type of thing like that, you know, it takes a long time for it to get into the system and to actually figure out whether or not it's working for the person. Okay. And then did it, did it help at all? So yeah, I saw some benefits. Okay. Well then maybe we just need to up your dose. Well, then we up your dose and you don't see any better increase in benefit. And they're like, yeah, you're a non-responder, so we're going to have to try something else. So that's what this whole therapeutic drug monitoring is, okay? Primarily, we don't want it to be toxic. We want it to be safe, and we want it to be effective, okay? So a lot of people miss doses, and when you miss doses, then you don't stay in something called steady state. And in steady state, that's where we're constantly, we're in this region where the levels are going to stay pretty consistent. So what happens is um, you give dosing, right? Okay. Give a patient a dose and it bumps up a bit. Okay. Um, but then it starts to come down due to how the drug is metabolized and then, you know, it has a half-life, okay, um, so it, after a certain period of time, only half as much of the drug is in the system as what we put in, okay, so it comes back down, well, then you have to take another dose, well, then that dose bumps it up again, and then it comes down again, and then the next dose bumps it up again, and brings, then it comes down again, it takes seven continuous doses taken at the appropriate times, okay, to reach what we call steady state. And the steady state is where it evens out. And with each dose, it just helps to maintain the value where it's supposed to be. It doesn't really increase it anymore. So once you get into that therapeutic range, 
for that therapeutic window, we want to maintain it at that, and we keep giving the same dose to maintain that steady state. Okay, so to find out what the steady state is or if the patient is in the therapeutic range during the steady state, um, we take drug levels, okay? It's very important to get the timing right on therapeutic drug monitoring. We do troughs, which is the lowest point, the lowest concentration that it should be, um, directly before we give the next dose. So right before you give the next dose, you take a trough level. After the dose is given, okay, an hour after it is administered, we give, we take a, a peak level, okay? Now, this, the peak time would actually vary depending on what the administration of the drug is. But if we're doing, I, for the most part, they say it's like an hour after the total administration of the, the drug. So if you give an IV drip over a series of time, it's one hour after it's done. Okay. You give an IM injection, that's boom, right away, right? So one hour after that. Um, but if you're doing an IV administration, it's not an hour after you hang it, it's an hour after it's done dripping into the patient and being delivered into the patient's blood vessels. So, um, there are different times, and when you're reading the book, you'll see that there are different peak times for different drugs. So, and they vary immensely. Um, but that's why some some drugs you only do troughs on just to make sure that it's staying in that effective range um, because toxicity isn't too big of a deal. Um, some of them you do peaks and troughs to make sure that it's staying in that range and not going to take out your kidneys or your eyes, right? Um, but the specimens that we the specimen that we want. Um, is serum or plasma, plasma, and plasma is the preferred, um, specimen, and there's a reason. Um, one, we want to stay away from plasma separator tubes or serum separator tubes because the, the gel that's the divider in those tubes can actually absorb, um, some of the drugs. So we want to avoid those at all costs. Um, some of the medications will um, be ionized, so you don't want to use EDTA or any kind of oxalate tube, like sodium oxalate, um, because they can chelate and bind to those uh, drugs, and then we can't measure them because they're taken out of um the plasma okay so the preferred specimen is actually heparinized plasma um of course most of the time most of the chemistry tubes that we have are lithium has heparin okay but if you're doing a lithium level you can't use lithium heparin you can use sodium heparin but you cannot use lithium heparin um we regularly would just use serum for lithiums and we would use lithium heparin heparinized plasma for all of our other ores <sighs> so remember you can't use lithium heparin for a lithium specimen all right um drugs Typically, um, can either they they can either float freely in the plasma, not connected to anything, not bound to proteins, not bound to minerals, um, and if they're free, then they are active. 
and just like those ionized ionized um calciums it's active when it's ionized right if it's bound to a protein it's not able to do what it's supposed to do so when it's free and not bound to proteins or or minerals or ions then it's the drug is free to interact at the site of action and cause the biological response in the cells or or the person okay so how much is free depends on the chemical composition of the drug for one um the concentration of the proteins that are in the plasma um if there are other substances that are competing for the binding sites at the receptors okay at the site of action um and then there are a lot of different medical conditions that can affect the amount of proteins that are in your system so in inflammation you have increased um you have increased Oh God, I can't remember the name of the thing that I hate. Um, reactive proteins, the like C-reactive protein and things like that, um, that are those acute responders. Can't remember what they're called. All right, malignancies sometimes have the same thing. Pregnancy, we got all different kinds of hormones floating around and what's going on with them. Um, hepatic diseases depends on whether we have proteins or or fats out there right so lipid solubles depend on whether or not we're using those or whatnot nephrotic syndrome if nephrotic syndrome if we have nephrotic syndrome remember your total protein value and your albumin value go down so that would mean that the proteins won't be available to be to bind to a lot of the drugs and if you have a drug that normally binds to proteins in large amounts um you might want to cut back on the dose on that if somebody has nephrotic syndrome because you're gonna what will happen is the proteins won't be there so you're gonna have a whole lot of free drug that's really active and it's going to cause exacerbated responses okay so malnutrition again will affect the the proteins and perhaps even some of the ions um and then if there's an acid base disturbance the ph can actually alter the drugs and, and do crazy stuff with them so you know um drugs were produced to be given to patients that are of normal ph normal protein values normal everything okay so circulating levels depends on how we give the drug um the routes of administration i believe are on the next slide so we'll just hang on with that um the route of administration the rate of absorption many times relies on or depends on the route of administration okay um the distribution of the drug within the body depending on like there's lots of different things that this depends on has is your liver functioning properly and do you have a lot of more adipose tissue do you have enough water in your system like lots of things like that and then the rate of elimination can depend on okay so are your liver and your kidneys working properly do you have a decreased um, motility of your gi tract what's you know is if everything's functioning properly and you're within normal values then the rate of elimination would be at a normal speed but if you have kidney failure if you have liver failure if you have decreased motility of the gi tract all of these things can affect the levels of the drugs 
okay? Because a lot of drugs are excreted through the kidneys. You pee a lot of drugs out, okay? Um, some of them are get moved out through the GI tract. Um, and some of them get metabolized and sent to the, go, they go through the GI tract and then they get absorbed as an active form. It's very, very, very interesting the way that this stuff happens. Um, the routes of drug administration, the most common one is the one on the bottom, the oral administration. Okay, so what happens commonly? Oh, here, write this prescription. Here you go. Here's your oral administration. You take it, you swallow it. Okay, now that's interesting because most people, yeah, I have a pill, I have a capsule, I have a a liquid and I swallow it okay hang on oh my goodness that was the longest message I've ever heard all right oral administration so we usually just swallow it and then it goes through the GI tract and it gets absorbed through the GI tract right not always um, some people if you look sublingual administration um, some like vitamin B, B12, um, stuff, you, you suck it up, you put it underneath your tongue, you have to hold it there for a minute to allow for absorption and then you can swallow. Um, I have the neighbor next door, she has, <clears throat> um, problems with certain medications. So she has one of her daily medications is a little, it looks like a, really super thin Jolly Rancher. Um, she takes it, she puts it between her cheek and her teeth and it absorbs through her, her mucosal membrane in her mouth. Um, and she has to not chew it. She has to let it dissolve completely before she, she can do anything. Um, so that's oral route. That's the most common way. Most people would just, you swallow a pill, right? <clears throat> okay. Um, there are intravenous administrations, so it gets, gets injected directly into your vein, right? Drips through the IV pole, right? Intramuscular, it's injected directly into your muscle. So um, there are specific spots where intramuscular injections should be given. Um, lateral thigh. <sighs> Cluteus and Cluteus medius, I think it is medius, um, right on the, the top, um, the deltoid, vastus lateralis, gluteus medius, and I think gluteus intermedius, I think, but I'm not sure, can't remember, but the, I know the deltoid, the vastus lateralis, and the gluteus medius are all areas where you're allowed to inject okay now there are also subcutaneous um injections where you inject it just under the skin so you can see these guys here is where the subcutaneous tissue is here um and then transcutaneous where you can inhale it or you absorb it through your skin okay so these are like patches that you put on and then it delivers it through the skin there are suppository or rectal um, rectal or vaginal delivery so there's a suppository with um, a suppository applicator and then for rectal administration you can also get this thing or this is much larger than what it looks like i just had to find a, a picture and i made it really small um, but there's a tip you don't go past a certain point with it you only deliver so much and then you inject how much is delivered all right so knowing that oral administration um actually swallowing something is the primary route of administration of drugs um you have to understand a little bit about what happens when it's delivered once it gets in there um 
so uh, this drug is going to go and get swallowed it goes to, through the stomach and it gets into the small intestine and in the small intestine where most um, absorption happens it goes through the gut wall and once it gets into the gut wall um, any absorption into the bloodstream goes through the por the hepatic portal vein to the liver okay now once we get to the liver okay there is a a wonderful wonderful mechanism the mixed function oxidase system which is a whole mess of different cytochromes with different oxidases available the primary um cytochrome oxidase that is used or that has a huge huge role in metabolism of drugs is the p450 cytochrome oxidase enzyme so you should know p450 um because he's extremely important in the whole metabolism of drugs so what happens is this thing will go through and through its metabolism process it'll create a metabolite okay and the metabolite can go into the bloodstream from the liver and then go to wherever it needs to be, wherever it needs to go, okay? Or that metabolite can go into the bile, into the GI tract, and then get reabsorbed into, through the intestine, into the bloodstream, go through the liver again. It won't get re-metabolized through the liver, but it'll go directly into, the, get thrown right into the, the bloodstream okay so because a lot of times it goes through and it gets converted the first time around this is something called first pass the first pass means that it's going to get absorbed but it's got to go through the liver first before it can get through to the bloodstream okay so sometimes sometimes it goes through and it doesn't get converted and it goes through and goes directly into the bloodstream no problem sometimes it goes in and gets converted into some sort of metabolite which then has to go through the gi tract again gets reabsorbed and then directly into the bloodstream okay lots of times um in in your book it talks about a phase one and phase two of of the um mixed function oxidase system and it says that the the phase one reactions typically re reproduce some intermediates those metabolites okay and then when it goes through phase two the phase two reactions um basically produce water soluble products and the water soluble products can either go to the kidneys and be, get gone out right goes into the bloodstream gets filtered by the kidneys and eliminated or it gets into the plasma and it's going to where it needs to right so water solubility is key for transport in the bloodstream so it's kind of important to go through the liver it's really important okay so eliminating the drugs um can be variable um well i already talked about how uh we have the the you pee things out right most of them go a lot of them get taken out through the the kidneys um but i also talked about how the drugs go to the liver 
and the liver can convert some into the water soluble ones that can either go into the bloodstream directly or they can go through to the GI tract, right? And so if it, you, it goes into the bile, which then goes into the, the liver, um, a lot of times uh, the, the normal flora that is in our GI tract or just the bile that is present causes the drug to not be reabsorbed. It just has to go out through the feces. Okay. So it gets, it gets kind of interesting. Okay. So sometimes we just, most of the time, most of the time, elimination is through kidneys. Doesn't mean that you know, if you don't reabsorb things properly or you don't absorb things properly, you don't lose them in the stool because sometimes you can. Um, especially people that have different uh, GI issues, disorders. Okay, so now we're talking about um, cardioactive drugs. So I'm going to talk about the different classes of drugs. Um, I very, very quickly talked about what a half-life is and half-life value. There is in the drug elimination and then pharmacokinetic area of the, the textbook can talk a little bit more about that. Pharmacokinetics is extremely um, complex. Pharmacokinetics and pharmacogenomics very complex. Um, I have, due to the incredible whining of past students, taken them out of your media lab um, assignments because they're gruesome. I know because I did them and I was like, I can't finish this thing. Um, but the uh, the half life thing, if you could go to, if you have any misunderstanding about the half, fact that the half-life is the amount of time after the drug is given where half of it is gone. If you don't understand that, you're going to either have to look up half-life um, or read about the drug elimination in your textbook. Okay, but cardioactive drugs. Okay. Sorry about the clock, but you're going to have to live with it. Um, so these drugs are going to benefit hearts in some way, shape, or form. There's a, car a cardiac glycoside, and then there are antiarrhythmic agents. So the cardiac glycoside is digoxin, and digoxin is used to help treat congestive heart failure. And the reason why it's there is to inhibit the sodium potassium pump remember the sodium potassium atpas pump um for every you throw out three sodiums and take in two potassiums right well in this case we we were kind of trying to save the calcium in the myocytes in the the myocardial um cells so we want to decrease the amount of potassium, so we would need to inhibit that sodium potassium pump so some of the potassium leaves and calcium can come in, okay, or calcium stays in um, because calcium is extremely important in the contraction of the myocardium. Okay. Antiarrhythmics. So your heart flutters, you have um, tachycardia, um, you have atrial fibrillation, you, or any type of fibrillation, you have bradycardia, you need an antiarrhythmic. Okay, so quinidine, um, 
lots of times it's um extend to party uh, queen is is a pretty popular name um they <coughs> excuse me <coughs> hang on sorry about that um I had to get a drink of water um <coughs> so this is uh helpful um in trying to keep the 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 cardiac rhythm correct okay um procanamide uh <clears throat> is also pretty helpful the um the the difference between them is how they are used in the body how they bind what what their um half lives are and things like that so um quinidine gets uh goes pretty quick through the system it has um you can get peak peak concentrations like two hours post dose okay um but it's you know it's a it says that it's absorbed pretty slowly so you know if you're going to take it for antiarrhythmics you need to keep a good um level in there don't try not to miss doses um we we don't typically do peaks for quinidine what we do is troughs we want to make sure you, you do a total value total level and see where you are make sure you're above that lowest limit you don't want it to be too low um but the only time that we really do peaks on them is when we're starting to see toxicity signs of toxicity or symptoms of toxicity so it's it's not terrible okay um the procanamide has a hepatic metabolite the n-acetylprocanamide um and it's really helpful if you're testing for both okay some immunoassays don't and some immunoassays do well interestingly enough um <clears throat> the n-acetylprocanamide also delivers the effects of antiarrhythmic activity so you really need to be measuring both and not just one so it's important that you have you have both of them in there okay disipramide or norpace um <clears throat> usually you'll give quinidine first if quinidine is not working um we'll give the disipramide um in, instead of the quinidine now there are people that just go on proganamide right but if you're if you've tried quinidine then you okay well let's try the disipramide to find out um if they can use this and if it works um interestingly enough um bradycardia slowing the heart down too much um and having dry mouth and slow gi motility and things like that are common side effects of this disipramide so <laughs> you know you, you kind of have to watch the levels on it so you know let's just keep our hearts going the way they're supposed to all right antibiotics okay for the antibiotics that we're talking about typically these antibiotics are given either intravenously or intramuscularly um and the biggest thing that we have to worry about is toxicity so we want to make sure that they're therapeutic that they're going to be at a level that's going to actually um, be effective against the organisms that they're targeting okay but antibiotics that are given via these routes are typically 
heavy hitters and they're um cause some pretty severe damage to um some organs okay so there's a bunch of antibiotics or a group of antibiotics called aminoglycosides and the aminoglycosides are genomycin terobromycin and canamycin okay um do not think that vancomycin is an aminoglycoside because it is not okay so gent tobra canna mycin all of those target gram negative bacteria okay they tend to take out kidneys and eyes if the concentration is too high for too long of a time. So if you have repeated high level exposure, so the person's in the hospital and you're trying to get rid of this thing, you have to they put a, a large dose in and then another um, <clears throat> doctor comes the next day, doesn't, you know, doesn't do all of his homework, goes, hey, we're gonna give him the high dose blah blah genomycin, and the nurses are like, whatever you say, da, right? And like it happens over and over, that person can actually end up with in kidney failure because they're not paying attention to what's actually been done previously. So, you know, always good to know what you're getting while you're in there. Okay. Um so almost always the aminoglycosides are almost always given iv they can be given intramuscularly um <clears throat> but they're not given in an outpatient setting they're given in patient um so you want to to make sure that you understand that okay we have these um and then when we're looking for them immunoassays lots of drugs almost all of our drugs are through immunoassays now um but sometimes we have to use the gas chromatography don't forget so um but just to get a regular random level on the person or a peak or a trough yeah we're gonna do immunoassays because they're a lot faster okay and then there's tacoplanin um tacoplanin is something that's there to kill bacteria it kills aerobic and anaerobic gram positive um rods and gram positive coccinae so tacoplanin was actually <clears throat> um we has was actually developed because some people just can't be treated with less toxic versions it doesn't work for them and they found that this was one of the drugs that is effective against methicillin resistant staphylococcus aureus so aka MRSA so they found this but then they also found that it has a long half-life 70 to 100 hours so it's going to stay in the system for a really long time but most of it is bound to proteins okay um it's not metabolized by the liver it goes out through and it's eliminated through the kidneys um so you may have to give high doses for it to be effective because 90 to 95 percent of it is bound to to plasma proteins right um so trying to get them in in their optimal range can be pretty difficult okay so that's why we do the therapeutic drug monitor on that to get them to an appropriate dosage make sure that we're getting in in the effective range okay vancomycin is another one um that <clears throat> is nephrotoxic and ototoxic so kidneys and eyes can be a problem it's effective against gram positive rods this used to be used to be um the go-to for MRSA okay 
Um, but now we have a few other options that we can give. Some of them are orally administrated, some of them are not. Um, vancomycin was always IV drug, so and you always went for your peak exactly one hour after the dose was finalized. Okay. Um, vancomycin um, has another interesting side effect. So with if the value gets too high, the concentration gets too high, not only can it take out your kidneys and you can take out your eyes, but it can also cause what they call red man syndrome. And your arms, the arms and the legs turn like bright red, go flushed big time. And you and look like you've been sunburned in weird ways. Um, but it, it's weird to see, but not so good for the patient either because they feel like they're burning up. Um, <clears throat> anti-epileptic drugs. <sighs> anti-epileptic drugs are like crazy. There's so many on them. Um, and there are so many different ways and so many different versions of epilepsy. Um, different types of seizures, different grades of seizures. So that's why there are so many different ones. Okay. So I actually found a, a web I had go looking um, because your book covers like 13 different ones and it says oh this one is petite mall and generalized seizures and this one is generalized seizures and this is mixed and this is that and, it. and so basically I was like oh no that's too much so there are narrow spectrum anti-epileptic drugs that are for specific purposes Okay. And then there are broad spectrum anti-epileptic drugs that cover a variety of conditions. Okay. So all purpose pain medication, take Tylenol, right? <laughs> you have muscle ache, rub some camphor on it, <laughs> you know, the different kind of pain, like different pain. So, um, <laughs> narrow spectrum, specific purposes now i will tell you okay ready this um dilantin through trileptal in the narrow spectrum you should be aware that they are anti-epileptic drugs okay the um the carbamazepines carbamazepines and carbazepines you know very similar no drug structures uh, Valproic acid through zonagrin um, or zonisamine, uh, also broad spectrum anti-epileptic drugs. You have to know that these are anti-epileptic drugs. There's another one, clonopin. Um, clonopin ha has been used for years um, as an anti-epileptic drug, so it's very important that you you know recognize those. Um, but we have phenytoin um, and phosphenytoin. Phosphenytoin is a prodrug. Um, and the phenobarbital and primidone. Primidone <coughs> is the pro form again. Um, and it goes, goes in, it's rapidly converted to the phenobarbital. So it's very, um, there's another one. Oh, the oxa, ox carb, carb, bazepine. Um, that's the, what the heck was it? Lil, lil, like, li, like carbazepine. Um, very effective, same type of deal. Um, not so much a pro, but a metabolite that you know, can act. It's like the active form. So, the oxcarb, I'm reading it now, oxcarbazepine um, is almost immediately metabolized to lycarbazepine. Um, and then the lycarbazepine is pretty much the bound or the active metabolite, right? <clears throat> so, Neurontin and Lyrica, we use those a lot for nerve pain. Okay, so 
these have multiple uses at this point. Um, so a lot of things are not so much anti-epileptic as their primary purpose, okay? But they find that it's useful, can be helpful, can supplement use of some other anti-epileptic drugs as well, okay? So, da -da 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 -da. Um, we want to maintain an effective level so the preferred specimen is a trough specimen to make sure that it is at an effective dose. Okay, so on to psychoactive drugs. And psychoactive drugs help to regulate psychotic um, behaviors um, and activity. So lithium, as we've talked about before, don't use lithium heparin specimens for lithium. You'll have extremely high values. Um, Lithium is used a lot of times to treat bipolar disorders, um, but it can also be used to um, treat recurring severe depression, um, aggressive or self-mutilating disease uh, disorders. Um, but the big thing with lithium, uh, lots of times people won't take it the way they're supposed to. So they start feeling going, you know, bipolar disorders have the manic and depressive um, phases. And when they going through a manic phase and they're feeling great, they say, oh, I don't need to be taking this stuff. And then they swing big time because they're not regulated. Um, but lithium, you want to avoid toxicity too high of a level. Um, so can't remember if they took it, so they take it again. That can be detrimental if they do that more than one day in a row. Um, but lithium today, we the methodology for lithium determinations is the ion selective electrodes. Um, I believe we talked about that when we we're doing electrolytes. Okay. Um, tricyclic antidepressants. There's a few of them. Um, we, a lot of times, will screen patients for tricyclic antidepressants to find out if there is any in their system or what a, a number might give a value to it. Um, but most of the amino assays that we have are for general tricyclic antidepressants. We don't, they don't break it down into individual ones. So if they want individual um, values, then typically they have to do chromatog chromatography um, to find out what's there. Okay. Um, but tricyclic antidepressants, insomnia, people who are insomniacs, um, de depression, the apathetic disorders, loss of libido. Um, so one of the, the big ones, amitriptyline and nor nortriptyline. Um, nortriptyline is, of course, the metabolite of amitriptyline. Desipramine, I can't say it right, um, is the metabolite of imipramine. Um, so again, these metabolites are also psychologic psychologically active so they help to enhance the effects um clozapine um is used to treat schizophrenia um so is a alan alanzapine say sorry can't do it um but um mostly clozapine a lot of times it's just making sure that they're taking their meds because a lot of times they'll just come off meds and then they have a schizophrenic break and it's just really terrible. Um, and that's, you know, if you live with or have any friends that have a schizophrenic in their family, then you probably know of lots of um traumatic experiences that happen with those schizophrenic breaks. So it is essential to try to make sure that they get their medications. Um, uh, avoid toxicity, again, is always important, but the schizophrenia 
um, making sure that they're compliant, making sure that they have an optimal response so that they, the, the dose is correct. Um, and if you have a schizophrenic who has drug addictions um, like heroin and crack and stuff like that that actually alter the brain chemistry, a lot of times the, the clozapine and the lanspine are not as effective. So um, if you have a child that's schizophrenic, like try at all costs to make sure that they have, you know, stay away from all drugs. It's, it's a terrible, terrible catch-22 situation to be in. Um, immunosuppressant agents. So why would we want to suppress the immune system? Because people get transplants. Okay. Um, so cyclosporine and tacrolimus um, are both used to suppress the host versus graft reactions for patients that are getting those heterotrophic um, transplanted organs. So a lot of people do not understand the transplant process. So I wanted to show you real quick about this transplant thing. Um, this is the recipient's normal heart. Their heart stays there. And we put the donor heart in, in conjunction with their own heart. Okay. So guess what? That takes up a lot more room. And yes, it makes a little bit, makes breathing a little more difficult because the liver, the lungs now have to fit around these, both hearts. Um, but, okay, uh, <clears throat> the vessels all come together, same places. So like, here we go, we got this vessel coming here, you know, we get stitches, putting things together. It's, it's great stuff. Um, okay, so cyclosporine is for host versus graft, but it's a bit more toxic than tacrolimus. Tacrolimus is 100 times more potent than cyclosporine and has a lot less toxicity. So guess what we use a lot today? We use the tacrolimus instead of the cyclosporine. Okay. Um, Serolimus is an antifungal that also has immunosuppressant activities. And this serolimus is given a lot of times for people who have kidney transplants. Look, diseased kidneys, look, further down, you get a transplanted kidney and ureter to connect it to the bladder. Great stuff, right? Um, mycophenolic acid, uh, mycophenolic acid, is um, a lymphocyte proliferative inhibitor, okay? It's usually used in addition to the cyclosporine or the tacrolimus, okay? Usually in um, kidney, pa kidney tra transplant patients and interestingly enough, if, you, if it falls too low, then there's a good chance of acute rejection. Um, so it's really important that, you know, you try to maintain a good level for those patients. Okay, antineoplastics and bronchodilators. So antineoplastic, what does that mean? These are cancer drugs, okay? So when you have neoplasms, uh, the neoplastic cells tend to multiply at a more rapid rate than your regular cells. So the methotrexate is there to inhibit the DNA synthesis for those new cells that are, keep regenerating. So what they do is they give high levels of methotrexate and then they follow it with leucovorin. And the leucovorin is used to reverse the methotrexate action because the methotrexate, if you put, if it's, there's too much of it there, 
and it keeps going, it'll stop all DNA synthesis and none of your cells are going to regenerate. And it can actually be detrimental to your healthy cells. So we do methotrexate levels to determine how much leucovorin is needed to stop the action of the methotrexate so that we can stop that from happening. And um, theophylline is a bronchodilator typically used for asthma patients um, and patients with stable COPDs like we've already figured out it's not getting any worse and whatnot. Um, theophylline is given for patients who are um, have to use the inhaler far too often in one day's time or have nighttime issues so that while they're sleeping they can still have their airways open um, sometimes it's given because people have issues trying to use the inhaler so they can't use it very well and so they give the theophylline instead so theophylline tdm is typically there to help to optimize the dosing um, or if we see symptoms of toxicity it's there to confirm that yes it has gone too high okay so what do you need to study for your tdm quiz and the tdm portion of your of your final right because this is all going to be on your final unless of course you guys want a test before them but probably not um when are troughs done right before the next dose when are peaks drawn usually an hour after the dose is done being administered um, what's preferred specimen most of the time heparinized plasma what therapeutic ranges the range of concentration of a drug that is effective yet safe um, what are the reasons why tndm is performed you know i need to know about first pass and drug metabolism and p450 what the difference between free drug and bound drug is um, how can bound drug affect dosing of the drugs um, what is half-life and how does it affect drug levels know which drug does what so name the name of cardioglycoside used in treatment of congestive heart failure digoxin right this is the kind of stuff um, which drug therapies require monitoring of liver functions notice that i did not in the powerpoint did not go through all of that but there um there are just a couple where it says that you have to do lfts um and if you have trouble finding that let me know because i can probably very 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 quickly come up with that on um another day which drug therapies oh yeah and that's it so that's shouldn't be difficult um the know which drug does what like the class and the purpose not so much for your quiz okay a lot of it is um about the other stuff but yeah there are a couple common ones that that should you should know um so you know what's the joxin what's the the antiarrhythmics definitely um so all those cardiac ones um i'm not gonna and pro i probably won't ask you about the anti-convulsant or anti-epileptic drugs on the quiz because of the fact that there's so many of them okay so stick with the other guys um know your antibiotics know your your cardiac know your um antibiotics and your antineoplastics and and those others okay there's a lot in those anti-epileptic drugs we'll save those for after the quiz okay um but you'll have a huge matching section um on the test that covers which drug does what okay all right have a good one